Welcome to this Property Hub University course. I'm Rob B, joined by Rob D, and we're going to look at how goals and setting goals can change your life. It isn't dramatic to say that goal setting has completely changed my life, and we want you to be able to take advantage of it too. The aim of this course is to leave you at a point where you've got a framework for success, so you can overcome the fear of not knowing what to do, you can avoid making expensive mistakes, and even if you've got limited time to dedicate to property, you can make sure that every day counts. So in this video, you're going to learn why goals are so freaking important. And if you ever listen to the property podcast, you'll know that we bang on about goals all the time. We're going to give you a complete goal setting system. We're going to tell you how to avoid the most common goal setting mistakes. We're going to tell you how to translate your goals into action and what you can do right now to get started with this. So if goals are so important then why isn't everybody doing it? Well, often there are obstacles or problems or challenges in the way that prohibit people getting started and using goals and transform their lives around. So what are they? Well, the first one is what we like to call analysis paralysis. So this is where you don't know what strategy to use, so you end up doing nothing at all. And this is really, really common. When you start diving into the world of information that's out there about property investing, you just read so many different things and everyone seems to have their own opinion about the best way to do it. They'll say, oh, you should only buy flats or you should only buy houses or HMOs or the answer. Everyone's got an opinion. It can be really, really overwhelming. You can end up just kind of exhausting yourself, looking at all the different options. And then at the end, you don't know which one to pick. So you end up doing the only thing you can do, which is nothing at all. We call it analysis paralysis, and there are so many investors who are the victim of this. As a result, they barely even get started at all. The next big one is money. People say, I haven't got the funds to start. But you don't need funds to start. There are things you can do to build those funds. So that shouldn't be an excuse. What these problems are, they're actually stories. The stories that you're giving yourself on why you can't or shouldn't start. But actually, not having the funds right now is not a reason. Another really common problem is to bounce from idea to idea and never really make anything stick. Again, it's kind of related to analysis paralysis, but in this case, you get started, you actually do overcome that paralysis and you get started with one thing, but then you'll immediately flip and for the next investment, you'll do something completely different or you'll kind of start looking into a new way of doing things and then you won't really follow through with that. And as a result, you might make some progress, but you'll never really develop a system, a way of working that works for you. And as a result, you dramatically limit what you can achieve. Next, and more common than you believe, is procrastination. We all procrastinate to one level or another, but some people do it really well. And they end up having good intentions, but they never really progress because they get distracted, maybe possibly a bit lazy. But often, they just put it off for tomorrow. You know, let's chill out today. We'll sort it out tomorrow. They procrastinate. There's always something a little bit easier to do, a little bit more enjoyable to do. That is a very common problem. Not one we like to admit to, but one that we see a lot with property investors. And you also get procrastination sometimes arising from not laziness as such, but not really defining what it is that you want in the first place. You go, oh, I'm only going to buy when I find a really great investment. But you never define what a great investment is to you. And that means that when you can never find it, you kind of lose motivation and the procrastination really sets in. It can come from laziness, but then it can come from really just not being clear about what you want. That's where this comes in. It's one of my favourite quotes. It's, if a man does not know to what port he is steering, no wind is favourable to him. In other words, if you don't know what you're trying to achieve, you don't stand a chance of ending up with an outcome that you're happy with. So what can you do about it? That's what this course is all about. And of course, the solution is goals. Now cement your learning by taking the quiz. Then we'll move on to the next module. Now, if you followed Rob and I for a little while, as we mentioned, we're pretty big on goals. But all those challenges, all those problems, all those obstacles can be overcome by setting goals. But what we're going to do today is give you a framework, not just to write goals down. You know, that's really simple. What we're going to show you is how to set very effective goals and then go on to hit them. And there are so many benefits to setting goals. First of all, they keep you motivated when times are tough. If you know what you're aiming for, it'll get you through those difficult times when things don't seem to be working. They'll also make sure that every action you take is moving you closer to your eventual target so you're not wasting any time. They'll also help you evaluate opportunities more effectively. So for any given property, there are going to be many arguments for buying it and many reasons against buying it. 
And if you ask five people, you'll probably get about seven different arguments for what you should do. But you need to have a way of evaluating whether it will work for you, i.e. will buying this property get me closer to my goals or not? That's how you'll decide. And so goals obviously are essential for making that happen. They'll also keep you in track and stop you from getting distracted. That's like the bouncing around thing we talked about earlier. If you've got a goal, you won't suddenly go and adopt an entirely different strategy because you'll know that what you're doing is going to work for you. They also stretch you and stop you from being lazy. So if you've got a target you need to hit, hopefully that procrastination that Rob talked about won't happen because you'll know, well, I can't just take the week off because I need to hit this goal. And another thing which doesn't get talked about so much, but is really important, is it means you can congratulate yourself when you get there. A lot of people, a lot of our listeners who we've spoken to are sort of really high achieving people who push themselves really hard. They spend a lot of time striving for something, but because they might not have actually sort of got the destination in mind, they could have surpassed what they originally set out to do, but have never really sort of taken a break and gone, ah, yeah, I did that. That's great. And so having a goal means you can see when you've hit it and you can congratulate yourself. Okay, so how do you set a goal? Well, you can set poor goals by just writing down, I'd like to invest in property. That technically is a goal. It's just an awful goal. You can do this a lot better. So that's what we're going to show you right now. So the best type of goal you can have is a SMART goal. And a SMART goal means that it is specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timed. All those characteristics need to be there in order for it to be a SMART goal. Let's take some real life examples of SMART goals from investors that I've met. One lady said, I'm booking a flight to New Zealand in nine months time. And I don't want to work when I'm there. So I need to have achieved my goal by then. Clearly, that is very specific. It's measurable. It's timed because she's got a nine month time frame. She knows how much money she needs at that point. So she knows that she needs to hit that goal. Whether it's achievable or realistic, that's for her to know. Another one is I met an investor who was 32 years old and he said, I want to be retired by the time I'm 40. That's obviously got the timed part of it. It needs to be more specific. It'll be measurable. He'll know if he's going to be able to do it. Is it achievable? Again, only he knows. But he's presumably going to have lots of other goals that are going to sort of keep him on track. And so there'll be kind of milestones on the way to his big goal of wanting to be retired by the time he's 40. Then there was someone else I met who said, I'm going to buy one property per month for a year. That, again, is a pretty solid goal. He knows what he's going to do. He'll know very clearly whether he's done it or not. Is it achievable? That's for him to know. But all these goals are maybe not as fully formulated as you want. Only you know your own situation and what kind of level of specificity you need to be giving your goals. But they're a heck of a lot better than I want to be rich or I want to buy property or whatever, where really it's have you achieved it? Have you not? You'll never know because it's just too vague to really be of any use to you. So just having a goal is better than not having one at all. At least you know what you want and you're more likely to find yourself weaving your way towards it. But a goal might be a big, distant, scary thing. So what we need to do is break it down into sub goals. And then once we've created sub goals, we need to take that a step further and then we need to create a system. And this makes you take action to working towards those goals. Then you concentrate on executing the systems and regularly check back to see how you're progressing towards your goal. So it's a three-step system. So we're now each going to give you an example of the system that we use. We did this on the podcast once before and people found it really interesting. So we're going to sort of briefly recap it now. I think you'll find that they're quite similar, but there are some differences in there as well. So I'll talk about my system first. So the first part of that is to kind of start with a deeper purpose other than just money. It doesn't have to be world peace. It can still be money, but it needs to be an amount of money that means something. It needs to be an amount of money that will allow me to do something with my lifestyle or allow me to do something for other people that I wouldn't be able to do without it. So we'll get more into that later. But for me, the purpose has to be there. Just going, oh, I want to have as much money as I can. That doesn't motivate me enough. But if you are motivated by making as much money as possible, that's rare. You'll normally find that you want the money for a reason. But if it works for you, forget the deeper purpose and just go after the money. So the next step is I'll set a two-year goal that relates to that purpose. So for me, two years is a good amount of time because I can imagine it. I can remember clearly what I was doing two years ago, and it seems pretty recent. And that means it is short enough to keep me moving. 
if I said five years, then for me, I'd be thinking, ah, oh, well, what does it matter if I let things slide for a couple of weeks? Five years is a long time. I'll get back on track. But two years is also a short enough time frame that allows me to make big changes over time. And that's a big one for me because I struggle with focus and I always want to be doing new things. But two years allows me to go, OK, I'm going to knuckle down. I'm going to do this for two years. And once I'm there and I've hit the goal, I can look at some other options and do other things. That's where property comes in. So at the moment, I've got a goal that relates to reaching a particular monthly income figure, which isn't an arbitrary number. But I've chosen it so that even if I have no other sources of income, I'll be fine. I'll still have the lifestyle I want and be putting plenty into savings. If I hit that goal, that'll be really meaningful to me because it means that I'll have the freedom to pursue interesting options without money having to be a consideration. And that's really valuable to me. So the next step is to simplify the action steps. This is working out the concrete steps that you need to take towards the goal. For me, there's real power in simplicity at this stage. So in property, we've already said it's so easy to be overwhelmed by all the different options and all the numbers and everything else. And you can get into overanalysis and lose focus quite easily. I met someone the other day who had his entire property plan on a tiny scrap of paper on his desk and he could carry it with him wherever he went in his wallet, but he really memorized it anyway. Every time he had to make a decision, he would just look at his scrap of paper and based on that, it'd be yes or no. His criteria were really, really clear and he'd boiled it down to something that simple. But you can do the same thing. You can crunch the numbers and say, okay, I need to buy a property every six months that gives me a return on investment of 30%. And obviously there'd be lots of other factors. There'd be things to think about with the type of risk you're taking on and how much time it would take you. But that might be your basic numerical criteria that you can use to evaluate an opportunity. Having done that, you know exactly what you need to be looking for and you can analyse any deal just by looking at that one number and saying yes or no. So that's what I try to do to take that big goal and simplify it right down for myself. Having done that, I then go into weekly goals. So on any given week, there'll be things that I need to do to get me closer to that goal. So it might be someone I need to meet. It might be something I need to learn. What needs to be put in place to make that happen? Some people prefer to have monthly sub goals, but I like to go weekly just to break it down into really tiny steps. And then I go even more granular than that and I'll get into daily goals. So each day I'll have three tasks that I need to get done that day that will move me closer to my goal. I plan those out the night before. When I wake up, I can't get distracted by whatever's kind of popped into my inbox or anything else. I just know the three things that I need to be doing before anything else. And the question I ask myself is, if I accomplish just these three things, will I be happy with how the day went? And so I want to be in a position where if I get my three things done, maybe I've got them done by 10 in the morning. But if I got interrupted and I don't get anything else done that day, will I be happy with what I've achieved? That's what I'm trying to do. Okay, so that's a great system. And I actually have a similar system. But the great thing about these systems is you can change them and alternate them and flex them to your life and, and your way of doing things. How do I approach goal setting? I start with the bigger picture. Rob calls it purpose. I call it bigger picture. Very similar things. Why am I doing this? What's the bigger motivation? What's behind the reasons for me setting these goals? As Rob said, money often is not a big enough reason. I think most people will lose the focus if their only reason is money. Whatever is personal to you, whether it's making a difference to the wider world or just to your family, both are fine, both are great and admirable goals, but you need some bigger motivation. That then allows you to put a financial number on that bigger goal, reason, purpose. So I always start with the bigger reasons behind what I want to do. Then when I get to those bigger picture reasons i start to split it down into sections business health charity it can go on spirituality it depends what you want it's what's important to you but you list them out and then subcategorize your bigger purpose goals and then you break it down in my version into a three-year goals for each so what are my three-year goals for business what are my three-year goals for health what are my three-year goals for charity and you list them out once you've done that, once you've got those bigger goals, those three-year goals, when you set them, you should set things that look at your comfort zone, what you think you can do in three years, and then jump over that line. Jump over the line that you feel uncomfortable. When you start to feel slightly uncomfortable that you think, well, these are stretchy goals, 
I don't mean go crazy, you know, if it's a business to say you want to be taken on Richard Branson in three years time, in, you know, in all his businesses, that may be a stretch for nearly everyone, especially if you start from scratch. But if you're starting a new business and you wanted a turnover of X amount, that's miles off from where you are now, it still may be achievable. It's just got to make you feel slightly uncomfortable, slightly out of what's achievable today. Once you've got those three-year goals, go back to a year and look at them and then take it down to a year level. So if it's a three-year goal is to run a marathon, a year one goal may be to run a half marathon. Things that are still a stretch, let's just say you don't run at all and a half marathon is still a stretch. A marathon's really scary, but a half marathon, it starts to become a little bit more achievable. And do that with each of your goals. So if your business turnover after three years is to be 1 million, then bringing it back to one year, it might be 150,000, say. A little bit more achievable, still a stretch, but something that you feel that can be done and that's making progress towards your three-year goal. Then take it back to a monthly level. So if I use that running example again, it may be a half marathon for the year, but maybe month one will be get up to running three miles a day. So if you're starting from scratch, you may in the first week get up to a mile, and by the end of month one, you've done a three-mile run in one go. And that's where these daily tasks or weekly tasks, or you could call them habits, come in use. So there's a great app called lift.do, and you can get into a habit of setting tasks that will allow you to reach those bigger goals. So a daily task may be go for a run every single day. Now, it may be in the beginning, you're just running half a mile, then a mile, then eventually up to two miles. But if you run every single day, even if it's just small distances to begin with, imagine where those daily runs will take you to in three years' time. Not only will you be running marathons, but you'll be doing sub four hour marathons. At the big three year goal looks very, very scary. Doing a run each day, yes, it's a stretch, it's something out of the, the norm, but it's something that's achievable. Taking it back from three years, big, very big goals, a year, quite big, still slightly intimidating, monthly, I can see myself doing that, and then daily habits, weekly tasks that will take you to the monthly, the annual, and then the three years. Once you're doing all this, set review times in your calendar. So I use the Google Calendar. Set, whether it's monthly or weekly, whatever suits you, a time to just look at what you've decided to do, look at the habits you've set yourself, and how are you doing. That review period will allow you to review what you've been doing. And if you've fallen into bad habits, let's say you haven't been for a run for a week, well, it'll give you that focus, that kick to go, right, let's get things back sorted again. By having it scheduled in your calendar so it's forcing you to look at it will help you stay on track. So start with the very big and then get down to the daily. Now cement your learning by taking a quiz. Then we'll move on to the next module. So in the last video, we talked to you through how we set our goals. And maybe the way one of us does it feels like it's totally right for you. And if so, feel free to steal it. But maybe you feel like those approaches aren't going to work for you just yet. Maybe at the moment, all you know is something like, I want to make money in property, or I want to quit the rat race. And you're struggling to take that and translate it into a smart goal that you can take action on, which we both started by talking about. That deeper purpose or bigger picture, that's really where the smart goal comes in. You need to make sure that you've taken whatever sense of dissatisfaction or drive or whatever it is that's making you want to get involved in property and translate it into something that's meaningful for you. And that's where this step-by-step -step system called a Dreamline comes in. It's a system for setting goals based on the lifestyle that you desire, and it's quite a fun exercise to go through as well. It was actually invented by Tim Ferriss in a book called The 4-Hour Workweek, which was really influential for both of us and lots of other people we've spoken to as well. But it's been refined by us and others into a spreadsheet that makes it a little bit more applicable for what we've been talking about in property, rather than what Tim actually meant it for in the first place. So it involves filling in a spreadsheet, and you'll find a link to that spreadsheet underneath this video. Before you grab it though, we're going to talk you through how to use it. So this is the spreadsheet, and you can see that there are three tabs across the bottom. Lifestyle goals, expenses, and property goals. We'll look at each of those in turn, but let's start in the middle with the least exciting one, expenses. So this is where you need to enter the amount that you're spending each month in your life as it is today. 
And if this isn't something you do already, if you don't have a budget, if you don't track your spending, and it's okay, most people don't, then you'll find this in itself a useful exercise. So down here, you can see a list of categories. These are just default categories, but you can change these to anything that you like, whatever suits you. And then just go through and enter the amount that you spend each month on each of these categories. So to fill it in quickly, let's say that you spend £700 on your mortgage. Maybe you spend £50 on your phone bill. You spend £100 commuting, um, £200 on groceries and £100 eating out. Whatever the numbers are, just fill them in down there and it'll calculate your total spending at the bottom here. It'll also calculate a bit of a buffer because if you don't want to get to a point where you think that you've covered all your expenses, but you're really just scraping it and there's no margin for error. So it gives you a buffer as well. So that gives you your total expenses in your life today. Now you've got a feel for your expenses, we can move on to something a lot more fun, which is the lifestyle goals tab. So the purpose of this is to give you real clarity about what you want your dream life to be like, because most people have got vague ideas, but this forces you to get more specific and it also forces you to put a price on it. So it breaks it down into three categories, having, being and doing. And I'll give you an example of, the, of each as we go along. So under having, it could be anything. It could be material possessions like a car or a second home. I'm going to be typically geeky and saying that I want to have a full ISA every year. So as well as my property investments, I want to be putting enough aside to fill up my ISA. So I'll put that in. And then I need to put a cost against that. In a Dreamline, uh, you could either put a monthly cost or a one-time cost. In this case, it's a monthly cost. At the time of recording this, you can put about £20,000 into an ISA, which breaks out down to roughly £1,666 per month. So I'll put that in as my monthly cost for having. And then you've got up to five slots to put in other things that you might want to have as well. For being, this is who you want to be as a person in the future. And this is probably the most difficult of the categories to think about, actually. But for this one, I'm going to put, I want to be fluent in French. So that's what I want to be. Then I have to think about how to make it happen. That's what this column here is for. Now, there's lots of different ways of doing that. I could go and spend a couple of months living in France, total immersion, uh, learning it all in a very short space of time. And if I did that, I might put it down as a one-time cost where I capture the cost of going there and doing that and any lost income that I'm not getting while I'm doing it. But instead, I'm going to put um, weekly lessons with a tutor. And let's say that's going to cost me £200 a month. So I'll put it in as a monthly cost. Then there's final category, doing. What do you imagine yourself doing in your dream life? Um, so I'm going to put just for now, surfing every day. This is not something I really want to do or would have much of a chance to do in London. But anyway, let's just say that I wanted to surf every day. Um, and let's say that I live by the beach. It's not going to cost me anything. Once I've got set up, I just need to buy all the gear and have some lessons. So that's a one-time cost of £5,000. So having done that, you can come down to these green boxes here and see exactly how much your dream life is going to cost. So that takes into account everything that you've just done above and your current monthly expenses. If you want to do that without a job, it tells you there in the bottom box what that's going to cost you. And maybe that's going to be a ter terrifying figure and you want to walk that back a bit and compromise a little, but that's okay. I encourage you not to compromise too much though, because this is about your dream life after all. And part of the power of this exercise is letting you to letting you really run wild and think about what you truly want in the long term. If having some kind of employment figures into your dream life, for some people it definitely won't, but for others maybe it will. Maybe it's just part-time work or something like that. Then you can enter that income into this grey box here. So let's say that I am very happy to do some part-time work. 
I actively want to do that because otherwise I'll just feel lazy. So I'm going to work part time and make a thousand pounds a month. So I'll put that in there. And then in this box, you can see with that job, what target monthly property income am I going to need to be able to have my dream life? And in the case of what I've just entered, it's £2,777. Now you know what it is you're aiming for, you just have to work out how to get there. And presumably, as you're watching this course, property is going to figure heavily in those plans. So you can come over to the Property Goals tab and start building out an idea of what kind of properties you might be buying to get you to your goal. Now, this is just one way of doing it. I don't think it's necessarily the best way of doing it, but it's a way of giving yourself an idea of where property could get you. So let's say that I'm going to buy a two bedroom flat in Manchester. I think that's going to make me an income of £900 in rent per month. And then my expenses, so the mortgage, the service charge, any letting agent fees, maintenance and so on will come to £500. So I'll end up making a monthly profit of £400. Then as time goes on, maybe I'll buy another one. I might buy something completely different, but just to keep it simple, let's say it's the same again with the same income and expenses. So that profit again. And so you can see down here, it works out what your per month profit is. And of course, what this means is when your profit is higher than the amount that you need here to achieve your dream lifestyle, then you've done it. You've got more income coming in from property than you need to live the life of your dreams. Now, as I said, this is probably not the most realistic way of looking at it because most people don't generate the bulk of their wealth through rents. And I strongly encourage you to watch our course, How Property Can Make You Rich in the Long Term, to get a feeling for the different roles that rental income and capital growth will pay in your portfolio. But it depends on your strategy. And again, we've got a course called How to Decide Which Property Strategy is Right for You as part of Property Hub University. And it's a good idea to watch that as well. Because for you, it could be as simple as you're going to focus on a cash flowing strategy like buying HMOs and you figure out that if you manage to get four or five of those, then that's going to give you the income figure that you need down here that's going to exceed your lifestyle goals figure here. And if you do, then that's fantastic because you have a clear idea of where it is you want to go and you know how you're going to do it. So then you just need to break it down into smaller sub goals to go, okay, how am I going to acquire each of those properties? The main part of the exercise though is this part here. It's working out exactly what it is that you want. And I think this is a very powerful exercise for forcing you to think in detail about what it is that you want and to then do what you can to quantify that. You might discover that the lifestyle that you want in the future is very outlandish and it's going to cost you a huge amount of money and if you're therefore okay to work really hard to do that and take some time to do that then that's okay maybe you decide that you want to scale it back a little bit so you could achieve it more quickly or it seems more realistic to you but just actually doing this exercise and working out what you want is so powerful because most people don't do it and if you don't work out where it is that you want to go, you won't know how to get there and they won't know when you've got there. For some people, it might be that you're already there, you're already within touching this distance, but you haven't realized before and you're putting yourself under pressure to do more than you need to do. So use the spreadsheet, go through these exercises, use each of these tabs, but really focus on these lifestyle goals. And by the time you come to the end of this exercise, you should have a lot more clarity on what it is that you want property to do for you. And once you know that, it's just a case of making it happen. Now cement your learning by taking a quiz. Then we'll move on to the next module. Okay, so using a dream line is absolutely fantastic. And I hope you're as excited about using it as we are because dream lines can really, really give you laser focus on what you want in the longer term. A dream line ties your goals to your desired lifestyle and in a way, it's really simplistic. But remember, it doesn't take into things like tax or capital growth. So it is a very simplistic way 
of looking at things, but if you use one, it will move you on a lot further, a lot quicker. It implies that you're taking all the profits to live on and spend on yourself. So there's no saving here. In practice, in the early days, you might be better to plow those profits back into buying more property and reinvesting. But the cool thing is it will help you come up with that income goal that's meaningful to you. So rather than just throwing a random number out there, it'll allow you to go, right, this is how I see my dream life. This is what it's going to cost me. It helps you create a smart goal. It's something that's meaningful to you. And therefore, you're more motivated. And it'll tie in to what you need to achieve. Taking the time to put a property dream line together will really accelerate your progress when you set goals. As Rob's already said, it encourages you to think about your lifestyle. It kind of goes beyond just the amount of money into kind of thinking about what you really, really want for yourself. That's really important because there are so many different ways to invest in property, all of which have very different knock-on effects on your lifestyle. So if you do your dream line and it's all about spending six months of the year scuba diving, you're not going to be wanting to self-manage 10 HMOs to give you the income to do that because the lifestyle that you want is totally incompatible with the means of financing it. And I think that's really important as well, because a lot of people who I've spoken to get all carried away by one particular type of property investment. Often they've met someone who does things a certain way, who seems to be really successful, and they get all excited about it and go, oh yeah, that's what I'm going to do. That's my strategy. But it turns out that the life they want and the life that this guy they met wants are very different. If they just kind of blindly go down that road, maybe they'll make some money, but they might end up being unhappy anyway, because it involves maybe doing things in a very hands-on way, or maybe dealing with people using skills that just don't come easily for them, so they find everything really tough. And so that's where this lifestyle component comes in. It might seem like it's a bit weird before you've even started to be thinking about your dream lifestyle, which might involve relaxation and everything else, but it's important. You need to know as well as just the numbers behind everything, is this strategy that I'm setting out, is this goal going to really chime with the lifestyle that I want? So taking your dream line to an action plan. So the first thing is convert goals into actions. So what actions are you going to take every week? These are the habits you're going to form. Say you've worked out that for every 100 houses you'll view, you'll put 10 offers in and you'll have one accepted. So if you wanted to buy two houses, you now know what you've got to do. Remember, it's not just about the money. Different types of property will have different risk profiles that require different amounts of hands-on effort and different amounts of capital. So you might have a great plan based on owning five HMOs that clear a thousand pound a month. But what work are you willing to put in? There's the time risk that you've got there as well. The higher profit property strategies often come with higher risk time investments too. If you don't know the numbers, find them out. The property goals section involves putting how much you expect to earn from each property, the rent you expect to achieve, and what the realistic expenses will be. Now, if you don't know what they are, finding them out can be a goal in itself. So that's a task. That's a goal that's something to achieve. You can take advice from letting agents, mortgage brokers, and other investors. And contact Rob and myself as well. We might know that area too. Make sure that you get down to specifics and what you're actually laying out in your plan is actually achievable. You might be overcooking the numbers, but actually you might be being too conservative as well. So do the research and then commit. You may find out that to hit your goal, you'll need three HMOs in London or eight flats in the southeast or 20 houses in the northwest. You'll have a fair amount of time to finding out all the relevant numbers for each option. And then think about how each option would fit in with your skills, your lifestyle. But at some point, you're just going to need to commit and take action. Remember, you're going to have to stop bouncing around from idea to idea and focus on one course of action. So once you know what you need to do, then take steps to making sure it happens. So while going through this whole process, there are some really common mistakes that we've seen people make again and again. So I'm going to run through some of those mistakes now so you can identify them and stop them from happening to you. A really, really common one, maybe the most common one, is just not being able to build momentum in the first place. So in other words, it all seems like a great idea, this property stuff, but life kind of gets in the way. The goal just gathers dust because you've not been taking action. You got all excited about it, but then one thing or another, you know what it's like, and before you know it, a year's gone by and you're no further ahead. What's the solution to that? 
The solution, as we've already talked about, is turning action into a habit. Even if you only dedicate 20 minutes a day to property, even if you just do 20 minutes a day, if you do it every day, that soon compounds. And if you do 20 minutes a day for a year, you'll look back and you go, oh, I'm way further ahead than I thought I would be in terms of my knowledge, my connections, my research or whatever else. Another really common mistake is not knowing where to turn for answers. So it'll get to that point. Maybe you're on the property goals section of the spreadsheet and you're trying to find out what your expenses will be, how much rent a certain thing will command, and you just don't know where to turn and you'll give up and lose interest in the whole thing. Solution to that is to build a team who can help you with these things. Building up a network of connections with people like estate agents, letting agents, tax experts, mortgage brokers, all these people who will be able to help you fill in the gaps. Because you can't be expected to know everything. No one does. But by putting a team together, you'll always have people who you can turn to to help you out whenever there's an answer you need. And so rather than having that as a sticking point, you will just quickly find out what you need to know and move on. The Property Hub itself is a really great way of doing that. If you go into the forums there, there are all these people, all with different knowledge. And by just kind of asking a question, you'll often be able to get an answer, either an actual answer or, oh, you should speak to this person or just to push in the right direction. That's a really handy way of doing it. That's one of the reasons why we started the Property Hub in the first place. And that's a great way of making sure that you don't make this mistake of just kind of giving up when you don't know where to turn. Another one happens a lot, just letting things slip. People get started at a really great pace and there's lots of excitement, but then they don't get the results they want right away and they just hit a roadblock and they quit. You kind of start with a really bold vision and then when things start not quite matching up to your expectations or getting a little bit difficult, you kind of give up. The solution for this one is accountability. Such a powerful answer to this problem is that rather than just kind of being accountable to yourself, find someone else who can hold you accountable, who knows what your goal is, knows what you plan to do at each step of the way, and will make sure that you're doing it. Maybe that will be something like booking in a weekly call where you'll sort of say what you've done and what you're going to do this coming week. Rob and I actually do this with each other for the Property Hub. We have a chat every week where we'll say, okay, this is what I've done on the business and this is what I'm going to do the following week, which means that if it's then the following week's call and we haven't done it, we'll have to sort of sit there and admit to each other, oh yeah, that I, I haven't done that. And you kind of feel like you're letting someone down other than just yourself. So accountability is a really, really powerful thing. It's so easy to let things slip if it's just you on your own. And then a final mistake is you still just don't know which strategy is most likely to work. As a result, you're really scared of pursuing the wrong strategy and falling short. And that makes sense because at some point, as we've said, you just have to commit to taking action. Whatever strategy you've decided on, you just need to go for it. And that's really scary because you could be setting a three-year goal and putting loads and loads of time and money into this and you're still just not sure whether you've plumped for the right option. We've got another course, which could be your solution to this, which is where we talk about how to make sure that you're setting a strategy which is going to get you to where you want to be. That might just be useful for you if you need that extra little bit of reassurance that what you're planning is going to work. As well as that, there are other options. Again, talking to other people. This is where a network, whether that's on the property hub or going to meetings or just kind of building up connections in your local area is really important because you can get people with an outside perspective, a bit more distance, a bit more clarity than you can have, maybe a bit more experience as well to kind of give your plans a once over and say, yeah, based on where you want to be, this seems like this could be a good idea. This is just the start. And it is. The property investment can be complicated and there is a lot to learn. And having goals isn't sufficient, but it's necessary. In fact, it's almost critical to your success. And that's why it's the first course we've created, because we'll get to everything else. But without this fundamental building block, everything else is pointless. This is the foundation to your success. The goals are the most important thing you can do because then we can build out strategies, we can build on education, everything else is possible. But without this focus, without this end goal in mind, the rest will 
probably end in failure. So this is so important. And that's why this is the starting place on your investment journey. So hopefully you've watched this course and we've got you excited about what goals can do and why it's well worth your time spending some time working out your goals and making sure that they're the right type of goals. So what should you do right now? A great place to start is to spend an hour filling in the Dreamline spreadsheet. It's a really fun exercise, at least I found it fun when I did it, because you don't feel like you're just wasting your time. You're kind of looking at all these exciting things for the future. You're working out how much they cost, putting a price on them. But you don't feel like you're just kind of dreaming because you are tying numbers to those. And you're also looking at your expenses and you're getting a real picture of possibly more clarity than you've ever had on your exact situation as it is now and what it could be in the future. You might end up having a really scary number come out of that and go, oh my God, I'm spending too much money. It's going to take me a lot of work to get here. But you might realize that your dream lifestyle is actually a lot more achievable than you thought it was. But whichever one is true for you, by just knowing where you stand, you're going to be in a much stronger position. So the next step, having done that, is to convert your financial goal into an action plan. So we've already talked about how you can go about sort of taking that and forming a plan of action around it. And we've also talked about another course that we do around strategy that might help you with doing that and kind of taking this number and putting it into a really detailed plan that sets out what you want to be doing and how you're going to get there. Along the way, you need to be having mini goals and make those smart as well. Specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and timed. Having these mini goals will make sure you stay on track and you don't just kind of have this big lofty goal, which you don't really know how you're going to get to. And share those goals in the Property Hub. We've talked about accountability and how important that is. Sharing your goals makes you vastly more likely to stay on track with them and achieve them. So get over to thepropertyhub.net, get to them to the forum and share your goals with other people. And you'll be able to see what their goals are as well, which might give you some ideas. It'll keep you motivated as you see other people making progress. And you'll find that having gone through these four steps, maybe you'll be able to do it today. Maybe it'll take you a week or a month to go through these four steps, but you should be feeling great at the end of it. Even if you've got all these things that you need to be doing and you've got the next couple of years planned out and it looks like there's a lot of work to do, you should still be feeling really happy about it because you're going to know what you have to do and you get a feeling that it's not just kind of some vague thing anymore for like, oh, I'm not totally satisfied with my life. I want it to be better. You've taken it from that to, right, this is what has to be done. Let's get down to work. Remember, if you don't follow these action points, watching this course has been a waste of time. So please, go and take action. Now, just take the final quiz and collect your badge for completing this course. Then, get started on another one.